Hello, Delaware. How are you? I am Rashmi, and I'll spend the next hour talking to you about many of the programs that we offer at the Delaware Community Reinvestment Action Council out of the uh, Wilmington offices, as well as in Georgetown, Delaware, so we serve the entire state. I'm going to start with something which I don't talk much about, and that's our advocacy program. So I'll devote a little time because there are a few asks of you within the advocacy world. As you know, we have worked very hard over the years to address the issue of payday lending, which we see as a debt trap out of which it is an impossibility to emerge. So the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has issued a rule that is for public comment. In concept and the core aspect of this rule, we support 100%. And concept and the core is ability to repay. Only if there is an ability to repay a loan should one get into borrowing a loan because, after all, when you borrow, you must repay, pay it back over time. There certainly are a lot of loopholes in the proposed rule that we will be commenting on to ensure that nationwide we have good, strong regulation regulating the issuance of payday loans, which are needed in our community, no denying. But what is not needed in our community are the 300% APR, 1000% APR loans. We don't want that. That is where it is that debt trap out of which it is an impossibility to emerge. Now, uh, CFPB or the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau cannot legislate or do anything about interest rates. That happens legislatively. So we have always wanted a rate cap of 36% APR. Even 36% interest rate is a huge interest rate. We won't get that in the state of Delaware. In 1981, under the Financial Center Development Act, basically our elected officials gave the banks our firstborn, that is the consumers, saying you could charge an arm and a leg and then some, and you're fine. So we would love for you to let us know what are your thoughts about controls on payday loans and interest rate cap. The third issue that we are incredibly concerned about is the debt collection practices. If you have borrowed money, and you have debt collectors harassing you, threatening you, collecting on a debt that is so old that you don't, nobody even knows who you owe that money to. Those are things that are already prohibited by law. So we want to be able to make sure that we have certain protections and systems in place within the state of Delaware that that which is prohibited by law is not enacted by those bad actors, bad apples, and then harm you, the consumer. Do you believe that, yes, it is a right position for us to take? If you disagree that we need something to control the collection on a debt practice, then connect with us. How? You can call me on my cell phone, 
824-5219. And please, between 9 a.m. and about 7 p.m. would be a decent time for you to reach out to me on that. You can also friend me on Facebook, Rashmi Rangan, search for me. My profile picture is my husband with the granddaughters. You can email me, rrangan at dcrac.org. You can walk in, talk to any of our staff about anything that we didn't even think about and should be thinking about. So at the moment, our focus is on payday loans, title loans, uh, because those are where uh, CFPB has issued a rule. Um, Consumer, well, Debt Collection Practices Act, strengthening that, M maybe sharing more with you about what your rights are. Uh, would that help? And if so, let us know. And we will devote a program to your rights and responsibilities under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Anything else money related that you believe we should invest our energies in. So we do a lot of work in the advocacy arena. Uh, some of the advocacy is on legislation. Some of it is on regulation, like legislation. We were talking about debt collection practices. It could go the legislative route. It could go working with the courts. We don't know yet which direction we might end up uh, to assure that our consumers are protected. Legislatively, we would be working on the uh, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Regulatorily, right now in the advocacy world, I mentioned the payday lending title loan. Um, otherwise, there are like the dot franc rule. If there is anything that comes up, we comment on that. Um, then there is just under Community Reinvestment Act, what we have as a right, which is when banks merge, we comment on those mergers, on how our communities is, are impacted, and what they can do to meet the credit needs of our community. So, anything else? Let us know. Um, if you remember, last year, around this time, we were talking about the state's budget. The state's budget of 2017, 28, no, 2016, 2017 budget we were talking about last year this time. So, we knew because the legislature had made it very public that the monies that the state received in the mortgage settlement would be used to plug the budget gap. Now that, I am sure, angered many people. It certainly angered us. So our board met in July last year. At, yeah, And we looked and we figured that we had to get the legislature to look at those funds not as a windfall to plug the budget gap, but to have that money go to the purposes it was intended. We met and didn't go anywhere, so we filed a complaint with the Court of Chancery. After we filed a complaint, of course, there was an answer. And then we had a brief that we filed. The answer to that brief has been put on hold. They asked very nicely, how about we wait until the budget for next year is finalized? So, June 30th, midnight, we will know what the legislature does with the settlement money. What we know already is that about 8 million of the settlement funds the legislature has already grabbed. So we are going to talk to find out what we can do because we really want those mortgage settlement funds to go to communities that were hardest hit by this crisis. So when I come back next month, I shall give you an update on what transpired. <coughs> so 
That's our advocacy effort. I seldom talk about it because on this program I want to focus on <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sharing information that might be very, very useful. I'll now talk briefly about our credit union. The credit union was chartered in 2011. Now, between 2008 and 2012, the credit union world changed and changed rapidly. Number of credit unions shrunk, number of members shrunk, number of branches shrunk, and this was not just for the credit union, but in the financial institutions generally. So there was very little confidence by people and members uh, in the financial systems, very little confidence by the regulators in the financial system, and uh, generally a lack of confidence around money across every segment, sector, if you can imagine go back or even now look at you yourself and see how confident you are in your financial institution. So if there is a fear, that fear is going back to 2008 when basically financial institutions did everything they could to deserve a lack of confidence in them. Anyway, it is in that environment that we were the only credit union that were chartered by the National Credit Union Administration. So, of course, we are incredibly proud. Credit union as an institution, as a financial institution, is very unique because it is membership-based. So, members' deposits are invested in members in the form of a loan. The interest in the credit unions is increasing. So already our credit union is a mentor credit union to two other credit unions around the nation. And we are incredibly proud of the path that we have set for the credit union movement not just in the state, but nationwide. Also, it gives me great pride to share with you that soon, and when I say soon, have patience because this credit union is new, but soon we will have two places to offer our services from. In December of last year, we accepted the gift of a bank branch from Fulton Bank. So we own this branch on 600 South Harrison Street. DCREC will be moving in gradually there, and the credit union will open its doors there when we have a huge member base that, de that basically demands in our business plan for growth and operations out of two locations. So. The credit union opening in a second location is dependent entirely on you. You become a member, use our services, and demand of us to be more convenient by operating from two locations. Why should you become a member of this credit union? First. It is a member-owned financial institution. If you live, work, worship, or study in the city of Wilmington, this financial institution is for you. True, at the moment, we aren't very convenient. We are open five days a week, Monday through Friday, but our hours are very limited. On Mondays, we are open from 3 to 6 p.m., Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 11.30 to 2.30, and Friday again, 3 to 6 p.m. So we don't have the full-blown 9 to 6, 9 to 5 hours. We still don't operate in cash, and chances are we won't. So when you deposit, we'll take your deposit. 
when you withdraw, we give you a check. But so that you don't go to a check casher, we have a relationship with Artisans Bank, which cashes your check at no cost to you. Our plans are for direct deposit and ATM card. Now, I've been talking about it for a long while, but it's only two months ago that NCUA has approved us to go that route. So now the wheels are churning and we are doing everything that need to be done to make sure we are able to offer direct deposit and ATM cards. The reason we have to do direct deposit and ATM card is we won't be open all the time, but if your money, and it's your money that is sitting in your account and you want to have access to it, when you need it, you shouldn't have to wait and plan when we are open. Therefore, that ATM card is an absolute essential. And that's very expensive proposition, but we will make that money is not going to hold us but in addition to that, there are a lot of back office things that need to happen, some talking that needs to happen before it can go live. So give us <clears throat> 60 to 90 days. I feel comfortable, but don't hold me to it because I'm not the one doing everything. We are making contacts, connecting, um, building uh, relations, uh, negotiating at the stage. And then once we sign the dotted lines, it will still take time to bring it live. It's not something that happens overnight. So anyway, best case scenario, 90 days. Worst case, this year, absolutely. Okay, so direct deposit and ATM is what we are working with. So I said, become a member of the credit union even though we don't offer direct deposit yet, but easy to become a credit union. Minimum balance is $5. So come to our credit union during the hours that we are open at 603 North Church Street on the east side, right across from Old Sweets Church in a row house. So come to the credit union during the hours we are open with one form of a valid photo ID that is not expired five dollars and your social security card that's it to become a member of the credit union then it is a requirement that over the next 12 months you make at least one deposit it can be for a dollar but keep your account from going into dormancy once you are a member of the credit union you have access to a few of our savings products so one is a share account. Why do we call it a share account? Because it is your account where you put your monies and save your monies, but it's a share. You own a share of the credit union. You earn a dividend. You don't earn a interest. What is a dividend at a credit union or at a business? Dividend is your Revenue, less expenses, profit is divided as dividends among shareholders. So I have come to you every month, every year to say at the moment, we aren't profitable. Our absolute bare bones expense for the credit union when DCREC absorbs all major costs is still $36,000 a year. And we are not making $3,000 a, a month in revenue because there are really two streams of revenue for a credit union. One stream, actually there are three streams of revenue for a credit union, but we will focus only on two. One is investment income. The environment right now ain't the hottest, so any money that is put in a certificate of deposit somewhere doesn't give us but percent so we don't look at investments from a huge revenue source the other stream of income is interest income from loans to our members again that is growing 
but not as rapidly as we would love to. Third stream is fee income. Now that is one source we really don't want to go to because if we build our business plan on a fee income that means we will be charging our members fees and we don't want to charge our members fees. So one of the fees that we have is a dormant account fee. If you leave your account uh, no activity for 12 months there is a five dollar every month dormancy fee. We spend so much time calling, mailing, even when the mail gets returned, to try and connect with our members that are about to go dormant. So if you are a member of the credit union and you have not had any activity on your credit union account, please just come in one of these days, put a dollar or mail a check that will be deposited in your account for a dollar, it will bring you out of dormancy. So opening an account at the credit union is easy. We have share accounts. We have several club accounts. Club accounts, one is a vacation club where you put your money, save it for a vacation. One is a holiday club where you save money for Christmas. One is a Club 1378, and this one is your 52-week savings challenge. Should you decide to take that up, on week one, you'll put a dollar, week two, you'll put two dollars, week three, three dollars, week 50, 50 dollars, 51, 52, and at the end of the 52 weeks, you'll have 1,378 dollars. We also, we do not have checking accounts. We also have and checking accounts in the credit union world are called draft. Um, we have share certificates. These are in the banking world, certificate of deposits. You can open a share certificate with as little as $125. So there again, one of the things we had heard was folk would save to open a certificate and then um, when they would go to open a certificate, they would require $500, $700, $1,000, and something would come up. So we decided to kind of hold your money, save your money for six months, nine months, 12 months. Actually, we have only six and 12 months that you would be able to put as little as $125 that came into your like a windfall and save it aside for a rainy day. Then we have three loan products. One is our utility loan, we call it warm loan. One is our share secured account uh, loan. So based on money that you already have, you can borrow against your own savings. And one is a signature loan. Signature loan is as it says, signature loan, you have to apply. Credit committee has to review. We look at your credit report, credit score, um, income, ratios, to make sure you have the ability to repay the loan that you've borrowed because after all, you are borrowing as a member your other member's money. So we have an obligation to make sure that we do strong, diligent underwriting. Also, if you are not making a payment, we have an obligation on behalf of all our members to go after you and collect from you for monies that you owe us. So that's the credit union. Coming soon is an auto loan product, but most importantly right now, our energies are focused on direct deposit and ATM card because we believe that this is a absolutely need, needed product in our community because the most wealth stripping area that we have come across is when you don't have a bank account or a credit union account and you get checks that you then go and cash at a check casher for a fee or you get your paycheck on a payroll card and every time you so much as touch that card you are charged a fee. So we want to be able to make sure that your access to your own money should not cost you a penny or as little as possible 
we are going to work with our financial institutions to make sure access to your money through the ATM machines won't be expensive. Now this ATM card we are talking about won't be a debit card. You won't be able to transfer from one account to another. It's just to check how much balance you have and if you have enough money to withdraw, that's it. So bare bones, basic financial services. If you are unbanked, you live, work, study, or worship in the city of Wilmington, I hope you understand that you don't have a need to be unbanked. <clears throat> if you don't know us yet, please come and visit with us. Research us. Ask us questions. Get confidence in us. Because ultimately, if you have confidence in our abilities, in our professionalism, is the only chance we have to make this credit union the most successful credit union for you in our community. So please give us a chance, test us out, and show that you have the confidence that I have in us absolutely we will go very far but not without your support not without your participation not without your guidance so i'm looking to you for all of the above participate guide us make sure that we are the best because we do not want anyone to say they, they should have no excuses to not support what we are planning to do for ourselves. And when I say ourselves, I mean us in the city of Wilmington. So, talked about our advocacy, talked about a credit union. Let me talk about our tax clinic. Tax clinic is very, very interesting. Naturally, one would think that if you are a low income person, because all our services are geared towards lower income community. If you are a low income person, why would you have a tax problem? The reality is that the very wealthy out there don't have tax issues. Or if they do, they have accountants galore, attorneys representing them to make sure that they fight the IRS. For our community, Tax problems arise in so many ways. I'll give examples of where tax problems might arise. You might be, you might think you are employed by a company and that you are an employee. But 12 months pass in January, you don't get a W-2, but you get a 1099. When you get a 1099, nothing was withheld from you over the 12 months. That means your entire full tax bill is due by April 15. If you are a W-2 employee, then of course every month there is withholding, FICA is withheld, employer matches the FICA, everything goes right, right? So at the uh, come April 15th, you might actually be due for a refund rather than owing Uncle Sam. So that's just one example of why my community could get into trouble. Another example why the community might get into trouble, you have a very small business, home-based business, and uh, IRS will pick home-based businesses, small businesses, saying that, that these businesses are not legit, or that these businesses really don't have the wherewithal or our tax cheats. So they're going to come and they're actually going to examine. When IRS comes to do an exam, IRS loves paper. And if, if the small business does not have adequate documentation or cannot fight the exam, then there is a huge penalty sometimes and what we have seen almost all the time after an exam 
is that the examiner will allow all revenue but will disallow every expense. So if they allow revenue but disallow expenses, guess what? You have a tax liability on the income that you earned because you can't take any expenses as a legitimate business expense. We also have folk that will listen to the wrong advice and say, you know, tax is unconstitutional, I will not pay taxes, and we have to do a lot of education and make sure that we get our taxpayers compliant with their tax filing and then establish a payment plan if a payment plan is feasible. If a payment plan is not feasible, placing them into a, you know, stop right now collecting when there is an ability to pay, then begin collection. Or if there is a little money, negotiate a settlement offer, which is called offer in compromise in the IRS world. So we do not do tax prep work. If all your problem with IRS is that you didn't file a return, then we are recommending that you go to Hudson Center on a Wednesday between 9 and 3. <coughs> I think they are open until September 23rd. <clears throat> or you can call us and I'll give you a phone number. There is a person that will do your returns by appointment, sometimes based on income. She might charge you a fee or if you income qualify, she might not charge you a fee. So if the sole dis, uh, problem that you have with IRS is that you haven't filed your returns, you have to go elsewhere. But if you get a letter from the IRS saying you owe them money or saying you need to send some supporting documentation, often in the context of an earned income tax credit or a child tax credit or a dependent tax credit, in those instances, IRS might want some more information from you. When you get a letter from the IRS, don't get scared. You can contact our organization. We are the only low-income tax clinic in the state of Delaware, and our services are available to you at no cost, except your time, of course. Leading the low income tax clinic is Anthony Doring. Anthony is a Delaware attorney. He has the CAF number so he can obtain power of attorney, speak to any revenue officer, IRS personnel, or your IRS attorney if you are in tax court. So we will go all the way to tax court should the need arise. In fact, uh, Anthony goes to tax court in Philadelphia when the tax court comes to Philadelphia in the event there are Delaware taxpayers there who might need either informal consultations or who might need representation at the last minute. So even if you don't come to us, we try so hard to make sure that a gem of a service that is available to you should you need it, and I hope you don't, but if you need it, you have the professional service available to you. All right. So that's our low income tax clinic. If you are in trouble with Uncle Sam, don't wait too long. Pick up the phone, call us, and yes, our services are absolutely free, and our services are provided by a professional Delaware attorney. Okay. Foreclosure prevention. If you are a homeowner at risk of losing your home, the very first phone call you will make is to the housing hotline, and that number is, I don't remember, but call 211. But it is with the Attorney General's office. You can also access information on 
a foreclosure prevention alternatives at two locations, three locations, Housing and Urban Development, HUD, uh, Delaware Attorney General's Office, Delaware State Housing Authority. So these are the three places you'll find all information. Of course, you'll find that information at dcrac.org as well. So the way our website is, on the top bars, there is a credit that talks about credit clinic housing, that talks about housing clinic tax, that talks about tax clinic and everything else. So click on the housing page and you will have phone numbers, emails, web addresses of all the housing counseling agencies. And of course, our information. So what happens in a foreclosure prevention world? First, you have a mortgage and you are not able to make your mortgage payment and your lender has begun a foreclosure proceeding. So a complaint has been filed and you have received that complaint in the mail as well as posted on your door. If that complaint, when you flick through it, also has a lot of information about mediation program. It tells you the documents you need to collect. It tells you the time you have to make a contact with a housing counselor and to move forward to seek a mediation date and be at the mediation with all information your bank statements, your pay stubs, your credit report, your tax returns, a hardship and proof of that hardship. So you sit down with your lender's attorney and you discuss one-on-one -on -one what your options are. The only way you can prevent foreclosure is if you have a steady stream of income. Some money must come to you on a regular basis. <coughs> if you have no income coming in, you cannot negotiate a repayment plan. What are you going to repay with, right? So the most important piece of work that you must do is get an income, some form of income, social security, social security, disability, unemployment, gig economy, uh, business. You need a flow of income to work with. I cannot stress that enough. Without income coming in, you might as well plan a dignified exit. If there is no income coming in, you need to figure out how will you walk away from that home with some money in your pocket. So get that income piece together. Get all your bills, credit report, credit score, uh, tax returns, everything in order. And then meet with a housing counselor learn what your options are because your options will be very different than your neighbor's options based on so many things, based on your neighbor's financial health at the time, based on the lender. So a whole lot depends upon the lender. You won't get the same thing that your lender got. So once we know what your options are, you'll you will have to do the hard work of making sure you work toward the goal. What your housing counselor will do is communicate between you and the lender to make sure that the lender doesn't say, I never received this. I did not have any communication with the client. So the lender is knowledgeable, learns about what the lender, the housing counselor is knowledgeable learns about what the lender wants, translates that to you, so you're working to make sure that you're working towards a resolution to your housing crisis. A lot of homeowners 
are able to work with the lender to save their homes from going into foreclosure. But when that is not feasible, then you have to learn about short sales, about deed in lieu of foreclosures, about waiting until the sheriff's sale and then being kicked out after the home is sold. So there's so much that goes in to a foreclosure prevention. Leading our foreclosure prevention effort is Lillian Harrison. She lives in Georgetown, Delaware, commutes to Wilmington on Wednesdays by appointment only. Most of the times, you don't have, as a client of ours, you are not required to be physically present at our convenience. There are so many times that any one of us will gather all the information, scan it, and send it to the person in charge who can then communicate with you so you don't have to waste precious hours that you should be investing in earning an income for yourself. So we are incredibly flexible. We use technology to our advantage. Um, that is your advantage as well. So foreclosure prevention is an attempt to save your home from going into foreclosure or if it must go into foreclosure so that you are smart about it and take some advantage and exit that home with dignity. In the housing field, we also have a title project. Now the title project is in its description very simple and implementation incredibly complicated. So what is title project? There are any number of homeowners and I would suspect about a thousand in the state of Delaware, give or take a few, who are homeowners, pay their mortgage, but they pay, pay all taxes, everything, but the home is not in their name. It might be in the name of their deceased parents, grandparents, great, 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 or going back several generations and you don't even know who owned it. So there are quite a few homeowners who do not have title to their home. And when you don't have title to, their, to your home, you cannot negotiate a mortgage modification, you cannot refinance your mortgage, you cannot leave it to your children, you cannot apply for a grant if the home is falling apart. So there are so many things you cannot do if you are not the title owner of your home. That title project is what we enter in and work with you to research first how far back how simple is it or how complicated is the mess to then decide to do something or not to do something because sometimes the title goes back a hundred years and over the last hundred years there might be hundreds of heirs competing for that tiny little parcel of land so you may want to just you know not do anything about it but at least you will know so that's the title project. In the housing world, there is a piece of advocacy, and I don't know if it is advocacy, but figuring out a good way to address this housing crisis we are in. And I've talked to you about growth program, which is uh, a national program piloted here, growing real opportunities for work through housing. Yep, that's what it stands for. And it has three little buckets. One bucket is um, acquiring homes in foreclosures, renovating them, turning it around, and selling it for uh, two former homeowners. One is a lease purchase option, acquiring your, a home, again, working with former homeowners that lost their homes in a foreclosure crisis who could conceivably over the next three years, if they worked very hard, could apply for a mortgage. It's a lease purchase option. And the third bucket, it's still being worked on. I's are still being dotted, T's are still being crossed. But to buy a home in a short sale and immediately turn the title to you 
and negotiate a mortgage payment for you. But I hope that it, it uh, materializes this year. Another piece under home, actually that goes under credit. So it's home ownership. And the home ownership piece in the credit clinic world is the last piece. So I'll start the credit clinic. Credit clinic is our longest program. We started in 1995. The reason for launching a credit clinic was simple. Most of us in America are financially innumerate. We know money, we love money, but when it comes to managing it, we aren't the greatest at it. Money comes, money goes, and if there is no money, there is credit after all. So, growing up in a totally different world, half the world away in India, I never knew credit. So, I grew up in an environment where my mom managed money very differently and that is the only way I know how to manage money. So, I teach that way of how to manage money. So, I was little when I started observing, asking questions, but when I was growing up and we are talking 50 years ago, in half the world away in India, my dad would come on the first of the month and give my mom his stack of cash. Then my mom would skim from the top, put it away. She would then pay all bills that needed to be paid in cash. Whatever was remaining, she would make five piles with that. And I would ask my mom, what did you do? Why did you skim from the top? And my mom would explain to me that my dad worked in places where there would be no pension, no guaranteed retirement income. And she had an obligation to make sure that they retired comfortably. Besides, she had produced three daughters. The three daughters had to be married and dowry had to be saved for her three daughters. This daughter did not take no dowry, but so she had to save. Absolutely. Without that saving, there was no way she would have gotten anywhere. Then the bills had to be paid. With what was left is what she would say, uh, our weekly living expenses. So I'd say, well, four weeks in a month She'd say, but there are two months with five weeks. Plus, this fifth pile is to make sure that there is savings for a planned purchase, such as a refrigerator. I was 16 years old when we bought our refrigerator. I wanted it in my living room so bad, so everybody would see it. But then when my guests would arrive, I would run and say, do you want some water? with ice, how else would they know that we had refrigerator in our house? So that is the only way I know to manage money. And I believe it's an incredibly smart way to manage money. I came here in 1988, September 21st. I was earning a wage of $3.75 an hour my income was less than my minimum expenses. Even then, I did my pay myself, the skimmed uh, the top. I couldn't pay me, but I would do IOUs in a shoebox. I would toss in the amount that I should have saved that month. So I did all of this until I had an income that was greater than my expenses, then I started using my mom's method of saving, paying bills, everything on time, spreading it over five weeks. So there was, if there wasn't enough money, we lived on peanut butter jelly sandwich. Um, and it was very comfortable. It's gotten to be my way of managing money. And this is the way of managing money that I teach. 
So at Credit Clinic, there are several different ways for you to enter. And they are very easy ways. You will always be in control. You'll always be in the driver's seat. You will choose when to enter, when to exit, every step, step of the way. There is absolutely no pressure. Just know that you could come in in the advancing prosperity um, station, um, which is a 52-week long assignment. Every Monday morning, you get two assignments. One assignment is save a dollar on week one, save two on week two. The other assignment might be a tiny little YouTube clip with a saving tip. That's it. Enter whenever you want, exit whenever you want. You don't, all I need from you is your email address and then you are on board. Now the station started in Wilmington is headed to your destination. If you join somewhere, say in DC, you would have missed from Wilmington to DC assignments but you can continue in the next round. We are building an app which will make sure that you can enter at the right station every single time, but we aren't there yet. So Advancing Prosperity is 52 weeks of assignments you receive Monday morning, 5 a.m., and there's just two assignments each week, dollar amount to save and a tip on how to save. The other way you can enter is Borrow Smart. Borrow Smart is offered on the first Monday of every month from 5.30 to 8.30 at our office, 603 North Church Street. You don't have to register. You don't have to sign up for anything. Come on the first Monday, which is tomorrow. Come on the first Monday at 5.30 at 603 North Church Street. We will feed you too. After the three hours of participation in a lecture-like environment, you will get three online courses. You will do those online courses, and for those of you who aren't very comfortable with technology, you can schedule a one-on-one, -on -one and we will walk you through technology. We want you to be comfortable with technology because everything is available on technology. So we have this. After you do all of that, Borrow Smart 3 uh, online classes, you have a one-on-one -on -one with our credit clinic director, Joe Gross. Once you've got that one-on-one, -on -one, then we develop your plan of action with you. You decide whether you want to work on your plan of action, but we will build that and give it to you when you are ready, you might not be ready next month, but if you are ready next year, we aren't going anywhere. We've been in the community since 1987. We will stay in the community. As long as the community needs us, we are here to stay. So that's the Border Smart program as far as education is concerned. Then we get into coaching. Once we've designed your plan, your savings plan, your credit builder plan, your home ownership plan, your purchasing major, like a car plan. We will be with you at every step of the way. So if you're thinking about buying a car, you will work with Joe Gross so that he can explain to you anything before you put your signature on it. But most importantly, once we are done teaching, you will understand what a truth in lending disclosure tells you it's a legalese that you sign every time you borrow money, but this will, you'll be able to translate something that says, yes, I borrowed 200 today, within 30 days I need to repay $800 or else you will take my car. That kind of simplistic translation of a legalese is what we will be able to teach you. And when you know that, then you are in control. With that, my time with you is ending, and I have had so much fun today. See you next month.